All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is the NASCAR show here on the Grueling Truth, where legends speak. I'm your host, Alex Gray, along here with Steve Grizzly. Before we get on to the O'Reilly Auto Parts 500 of Texas, some big news came out today. Um, did you hear that Charlotte Motor Speedway, after the success of the Roval, they're going to run the Coca-Cola 600 on dirt. That's right. They're going to put dirt on the track. Can you believe it? The news came out on uh, April 1st. I think it's fabulous. I think we need to go back to dirt track racing. That's that's what the sport was based on. Of course, we know better, don't we, Alex? Of course. (laughs) April Fool's. Fool's. There you go. Yeah, nice nice gig for them. But it's fun to see NASCAR just kind of getting back and they're not taking themselves too seriously and having some fun with it. And I think that's part of the regeneration of the sport. Um, yeah. You know, numbers are coming up on, on TV ratings, uh, everything, and it's getting a little more exciting. NASCAR seems to be headed in the right direction. I guess my first question to you on that is, is this a matter of moving Brian France out of NASCAR that we're seeing this resurgence? Jim France is taking over. Are, are we? Is this kind of one of the factors that Brian France just kind of didn't have any idea how to run the sport? I think it's a factor. Um, I really didn't like a whole lot of the moves that, you know, Brian France made. Obviously, under him, NASCAR would be making changes every one or two years, whether it's the playoff format, the cars, the aero package. Um, But ever since, you know, everything went down last year and Jim France took over, I think things have been a a little bit better. Obviously, NASCAR will continue to test things as they are approaching this, this, quote, Gen 7 era, this new generation. Uh, this new renaissance for NASCAR. Uh, that, that's, yeah, I, what I'm, that's what I'm seeing. Is the Gen 7 car going to go to the composite body? Um, I have not heard a whole lot. I know that they're talk, they want to get it out by 2021, although they're still in a lot of talks and planning stages uh, with the cart and even some potential new manufacturers, uh, if needed, don't, you know, I, let me let me get some advice to the Gen 7 car. Don't rush it. If you need to push it back to 2022, so be it. I don't rush it. Get a good product out there. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they've got the Xfinity Series where they can keep playing with it and keep dialing it in. I think, mm-hmm. was, was, was it the car of tomorrow that came out um, in Bristol where – Kyle Busch poo-pooed a big time and won the first race in the car tomorrow. Remember mm-hmm. that thing, that, that ordeal? Is that kind of the same thing where maybe they pushed that car out a little too fast and they had to work through it um, while trying to run a series? If this way, you, you've got the understudy, you, you've got the Xfinity race, just dial it in, get it right, get everything mm-hmm. fixed, lower the costs, so get more teams back on the track, and mm-hmm. let it go. Are we both in agreement there? Yes, quality is always better over quantity. I agree entirely. Um, okay, let's talk about Texas. Yes. Denny Hamlin. Uh, it's his second win. Uh, he's yeah. looking strong. Coming back he, from he's... two penalties. On go pit ahead. Coming back yeah, from go ahead. two penalties. Yeah, two penalties on pit road uh, Hamlin had, and he was able to fight back all that and win. Uh, of course, pit strategy also played a factor. Clint Boyer getting second. How about this? Daniel Suarez third, Eric Jones fourth, Jimmy Johnson fifth. I can't recall the last time he posted a top five, honestly. William Byron sixth. So some of the younger guys, too, that really needed a boost got a really good finish here. Amarola, Harvick, and then the Bush brothers rounding out the top ten. Chevrolet looked so much better, especially on the Hendricks side. They looked a lot better. Johnson was on the pole, and he kept it on. You know, he led like the first – 50, 60 laps or so, uh, Johnson, he was kind of flirting up there in the top 10 most of the race, which I was very impressed by. Uh, Chase Elliott got 13th. Uh, Dylan was running up there, too. They kind of fell back, but still in the top 15. They were they were there. Um, but, yeah, Denny Hamlin, he already looks a lot better than last year. You know, he was kind of quiet last year, no wins, came close to winning the Brickyard 400. This year, he's on a roll, and I think he could be a threat for the championship. Yeah, I haven't looked at the standings yet. Exactly, we'll get to the standings here in a second. Um, but he's got to be up there now uh, with two wins. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's locked into the chase. Um, Clint Boyer, you know, he's hot and cold. 
I mean, I, I don't know. Is, is Clint Boyer a good driver, or is, does he have good equipment? What's the deal with Clint Boyer? I mean, he's kind of all over the map every race. Yeah, he's kind of been up and down. You know, he has some pretty good. He has some pretty decent success at uh, Richard Childress Racing, and then uh, 2012, he had a really good year at Michael Walter Racing, and things kind of just tampered off a bit. Of course, he spent the one year with uh, H. Scott Motorsports. That was just a wait year to get into Stuart Haas. Um, he's been, you know, 2017 was kind of shaky. Last year was a lot better for him. I believe, you know, he got all the way to the round of eight and, uh, he's kind of been up and down, but I think Boyer's a pretty good driver. Um, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and I think the biggest story here to me is the resurgence of Hendrick and a, finally a, a fairly strong showing for Chevrolet. Uh, first mm-hmm. time this year. What, seven races? I think there were seven races into it now, are we not? Yeah, it's about seven races. Um, you know, yeah, Chase Elliott. And, yeah. Chase ran second. He ran second. He ran strong. And I don't know, you know, in the end, of pit stops and pit strategy always plays a factor in that. You get mired in the traffic. Um, but Johnson, you know, wins the pole in, in a Hendrick car. Byron runs strong. Um, you know, Kurt Busch continues to do well um and then chase you got you got now you got a little resurgence and maybe are they figuring out the camaros a little bit better or it was just it just is a track that kind of favors that you know the aero package that sets up for the camaros uh i think i think they're starting to figure it out now uh i think it started with chase Elliott fishing second at martinsville and uh, i think now you're starting to see that and as we head into uh bristol and richmond couple more short tracks. I can see Chevrolet uh, flirting with the possibility of a win or two uh, in those next few races. Um, let's see what else I wanted to point out here. So, yeah, and not to mention, I I thought the race yesterday was actually really good. There was, a, there was a lot of passing, a lot of jottling for a position. I was actually kind of uh, impressed by it. I thought it was a really good race. No, I, I did too. Yeah, yeah I, I thought it was – but Texas lends itself to that because it's kind of really – I would kind of call Texas more of a super speedway than I would anything else. If I – you know, it's you know, oh, it's a mile and a half track, I believe. Um, yes. Yeah, and, but but it, it's banked so much that it runs like a super speedway. And that opens it up for a lot of pack racing, a lot of bunching up. I mean, you saw on the restarts – Four cars wide, going into into turns one and two, diving in, and, and you, you find the leaders pull out, you know, good in single file as fast as they could, but they always do that. But then you got all of a sudden now you've got a bunch of great racing going on behind them, and um, that's kind of the track that, that NASCAR needs to be more fan friendly with, and build more of those tracks or get their tracks built more that way because I did, I, I enjoyed the race yesterday. I, I really enjoyed watching. It. Um, the, the competition going on, a lot of jockeying. A lot of guys could have won that race. Um, there were a lot of guys that could have won that race. Um, kind of like it's almost like a Daytona or a Talladega. You didn't know. But yeah, Hamlin no, definitely – go ahead. Hamlin had a fast car, but, yeah, it felt like there was really no extremely dominant car. Like, you knew that driver was going to win. You know, you saw it, you know, kind of switch back and forth between, like, Blaney, Hamlin, Bush – and many more. I was really impressed by that. Okay, the $10 question here is Kevin Harvick. He's kind of been kind of not real, I don't want to say not competitive, but he's in the top. He's, you know, he finished eighth. Yeah, he finished eighth in this race, but really was he a threat? Yeah, I mean, he didn't leave any laps, um, I don't think. Uh, he, has he led a lap this year? Has Harvick even led a lap this year? Uh, I want to say he's I don't probably, know. Yeah, he's, where is Harvick in points, by the way? He's currently uh, listed. Yeah. yeah, I'll go to standings here real quick and look at standings. Um, he's currently listed third in the highest without a win right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's competing, and I think a win's going to come soon for him. Laps led. Harvick has led 133 laps. Well, so he's done all right then. Mm-hmm. He's not not been out of it entirely, but he just doesn't seem to be the Kevin Harvick we know. I mean, Atlanta has always been his track. He didn't fare well there necessarily. Texas is a track where he's won it multiple times. Um, 
I don't know. Um, you know, is this going to be an off year for Kevin Harvey, you think? Uh, who knows? I mean, he, I, he's still going to make the playoffs for sure. And I think oh, yeah. He'll, yeah, he'll get a win. No, he'll – yeah, I think, you know, last year Harvick went off. 2017, he was kind of quiet. Um, hard to say. But uh, I, I think he'll still be a, a title contender in the end. All right. Jimmy Johnson wins pole, uh, runs mm-hmm. strong for uh, a good part of the race. Um, are we seeing a resurgence out of him, or was this just a, a, another track? He, Jimmy Johnson had good success at Texas as well. Um, is this a one-off thing for him, or do we think he's coming back and starting to, you know, connect with his new crew chief? Uh, it is a possible resurgence. It's hard to really say at this point, but I think it's a good first step towards a, a better season and a good resurgence for Jimmy Johnson was a, a kind of race at Texas that he ran. It's definitely something that he needed leading those early, those opening laps as well. I think that was a, a good first step, and, Hopefully, it could build some momentum for him in that 48 team. And Kyle Busch uh, still leads the standings. Uh, yep. He was competitive, but didn't seem to have the dominant car. Um, uh, he he we, hit the wall early, or late in the race. He hit the wall. He kind of just the car lost. He lost the car a little bit. Hit the wall, and uh, he came back and finished tenth, which I was really impressed by after having to go down pit road and getting it fixed. So. Good job by the 18 crew there. There you go. Um, and I, I still think Kyle Busch is, is the, the, the driver to beat um, in NASCAR right now. I think, you yeah, know, I think Hamlin's right there with him now, but Bush seems to be able to win in anything he, he gets in the seat in and is able to do it himself and, and get a win. So I think he's still the guy to beat. Um, so you've got what now? You've got Bush and Hamlin with two wins. Kozlowski with two wins. Again, you're, you're talking about you're, you're talking about um, JGR and Penske. And again, I go back to the arrow thing, and I'm going to ask you again now. It's another race now where these guys that have these Indy cars and have the ability to get arrows packages and engineers and, and get off of that is the, again I ask you, Alex, is that making a difference for these guys? Because I mean, you know, the, the the Hendrick boys don't have that. You know, yeah. and you got, you got, Eric, you got Eric, Eric Amarola, um, who's part of Haas and Haas Automation. We know they run a Formula One package. They're getting mm-hmm. aero uh, engineering. Is again, is this making a difference in NASCAR? And do they need to do something about this? Well, I think Roger Penske. Obviously, I think he's like the godfather of motorsports. He owns V8 Supercars, IMSA Sports Cars, uh, Indy Cars. You know, he's definitely one of the most successful motorsport managers out there, if not the most successful that I know of. Um, and, and, yeah, it could play to some of that advantage with all the money he's earned, too. Um, it could play a factor, but it's really hard to say. Uh, I always believe team dominance goes in, uh, goes in waves, goes in spurts. You know, you, you know, you got Hendrick for a long time, and, then, you know, Gibbs and Penske kind of snuck into the picture. Now, you know, they were there as a top team, but now they're like, wow, we, we got to beat these guys. You know, that's how I see it. Like last year it was Stuart Haas. Now they, I believe last year it was definitely Stuart Haas who came to be. This year you're seeing it's more of Penske and Joe Gibbs. Right. Yeah. And Logano was fairly strong um, for a good part of the race, too. And, um, you know, pit strategy plays so much into this. And how much, in your opinion, does the stage racing affect pit strategy? Because you, you see guys coming in two or three laps to four, Right. Uh, they close the pits. They come in. I mean, is is that good for the sport? I, I know it makes for more interesting racing in in the middle stages of the race when you think it's great to parade now. We're all going to wait for the last twenty laps, and everybody's going to go, mm-hmm. you know, crazy and go after it. But the stage racing kind of changes that. But how much do you see that where? guys are deciding when to pit. I mean, is that good for the sport or bad for the sport in terms of the, the pit strategies and getting guys out of sequence, getting guys in sequence, creating your own sequence? What? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, the, I, I was never really sure what to think of the stage racing. Um, my original thought when it first came out was that my generation had a uh, much shorter attention span and, you know, to keep the race 
more and more interesting. I always believe that's why they made stage racing. Um, but of course, the appeal to the younger fans. But uh, the stage racing has created, I think, more different. I think different racing for sure. Um, maybe sometimes it can get more aggressive because you know now they're like, okay, if I finish in the top ten, I gotta get those extra points towards the playoffs. Which is why I personally believe last year's summer Daytona race was the crash fest, crash fest that it was. Um, so, yeah, it definitely plays to a lot of strategies. I've noticed that, you know, guys can come in and pit with, like, three, four laps to go. Um, it, it has created different strategies for sure. You know, whether it's good for NASCAR or not, I really do not know. But uh, it, 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 I think it, it can go in both ways, that it can be good and it could potentially be not so good. I'll leave it as that. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I like it. I, I like the fact that it, it, you see guys making decisions, you, you know, with, with, with five to ten laps to go in a stage. I wonder mm-hmm. if it should shorten the stages up more and maybe have more stages uh, and, and maybe more coincided with pit windows uh, for the cars um, to bring them in. I don't know if that's good or bad because – you see guys fall back, and you get the penalties. You know, and Hamlin occurred two times, but he overcame them. But other guys, you come into the pits, and they, they, you know, they get themselves in trouble. And they, they, you take a guy who's running first or second, and then he gets a, a pit violation or has to make a pit strategy, changes come, and then a caution comes. It, it, it definitely alters the race. So, in general, I'm in favor of it. I, I think it's good. Mm-hmm. I might say shorten the, the stages up a little bit and yeah. make them maybe more coincide with pit windows uh, for each given track. Um, but on the other side, it's a chess game. You know, they yeah. made NASCAR a chess game. So you have to decide, you know, the, pit crew, the crew chiefs got to decide when they want to do it, if they want to just wait for the yellow to come out on, on, on the stage, or if they want to bring in two laps early and then get track position again when everybody else comes out, you know, and, and does the, the pit stops on, on the uh, stage yellows. So, I don't know. I Overall, I think it's good for the sport, is where I'd say. Um, so, okay, let's talk about um, let's talk about qualifying. There's a lot of yakking out there going on about going back to single car qualifying. I yeah. don't agree. I don't agree at all. Well, I think, I think the issue that I've seen with Auto Club in Texas, short tracks aren't really an issue. The uh, the new aero package is more dra- – I feel like it's more track dependent. And the reason why these uh, these guys don't want to go out first is because – they don't have. They can't pick up the draft and gain more speed that way and pass everybody, and they can get a quicker time that way. I think that's why um, nobody wants to come out. Um, I I won't lie on Twitter. I did say you know this is kind of silly. Go back to single car qualifying. You know, and I can understand why you don't want it. I can understand why people would want it. Um, it is kind of frustrating because it's like it is qualifying. It sets the field of the race. You know, I don't. You know, I can understand if NASCAR wants to try and make it entertaining, but you don't need to do anything fancy, you know. It's, you know, Bob Pockers actually uh, said this, and I said it here on the show, and I even voiced the uh, the pros and cons. It w- the pros to, it was basically like heat races, like you'd see at the, the Daytona 500 with the duels. The pros mm-hmm. to that is you would see some excitement, you know, racing, jottling for a starting position, but then the downside is, the more potential of wrecked cars and going to backup cars, and you, that's tough on teams. So, yeah, I don't really know what the, the true answer is. Maybe single car qualifying. Uh, NASCAR actually has said today, this is not an April Fool's joke, because uh, it's been reported by Yahoo Sports, NASCAR.com. Uh, NASCAR might return to single car qualifying on the, quote, drafting tracks. Steve O'Donnell basically said in an interview on Sirius XM NASCAR, we're going to try and look at every option, including the possibility of going to single car qualifying. The morning drive program, he said on there, um, the reason we haven't is that's on the teams. The parts and pieces, we've tried to be as efficient as possible trying this method of group qualifying, which, again, I can see why. Uh, but it looks like right now they're just looking at all sorts of options. Um, the next tracks right now that could be problematic is Kansas on May 11th. 
And, uh, of course, they're going to do single card qualifying at Talladega. They've been doing that for a few years already. Right. So, well, they, 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 yeah, they do single car on, on the super speedways because safety, I mean, you don't want to pack pack racing going on there. You, you wreck one, you're going to wreck 30. Yeah. Most likely. So <laughs> I, I, I get that. You know, I get that. But I, I think this, this is not on NASCAR. And I, I know I read your comments on Twitter and, I, you know, and, um, I, I think that this is not on NASCAR, you know, he qualifying or whatever they're doing, how they're doing it. I, I think it's more compelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it, it makes you think, and I think this is totally on the drivers and the crew chiefs that, yes. you know, they want to sit there and jack around with this stuff. I mean, it, it's out there. You get 15 minutes to get your car out there and put a lap down and run it. And just if go. you want to sit there and jack around, just go. Yeah, go. R- run your lap. I mean, if you want single car qualifying, why sit on, on pit lane for, you know, 14 minutes and 30 seconds and then go out in the last 30 seconds and try and run a lap? You want a clean air. You want clean single car qualifying. Go out and do it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Kurt Busch did it. Kurt Busch went down uh, a couple races ago. He threw down a lap, and he, he ended up 12th out of the 12 final qualifiers. Right. Uh, you know, because he didn't have the draft. But he said, no, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to go out and I'm going to put my lap down and get my lap. Um, the, uh, I, I think I think it would be a mistake to get away and go back to single car. Because single car qualifying is incredibly boring. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, it used to be compelling at Indianapolis when you ran four laps. And right. your, your qualifying time was four laps. And, and you know, and, and you had Tom Carney going, it's a new track record. Tom Steva, <laughs> 201.32 miles an hour, and the crowd went nuts. And, yeah, you know, well, but yeah. this is this is a one-lap thing. Cars go out, they run one warm-up lap, they run one lap, then they're off, and the next car's already on the track running. I think the, 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 the pack qualifying is much better. I think they need to stick with it. I think NASCAR needs to just put their foot down and say, no, this is not on us. This is on you guys. We give you adequate time to go out and run your laps. If you want to run single car, Get your butt out there early and go run your lap and park your car and wait for the next session if you if you right. make it. So I hope they don't change it. Um, like I said, I understand the necessity at, yeah. at restricted plate tracks um, because you just don't want to bang up 30 cars. Um, and that's what will happen. A, a, a guy, a guy starting to guarantee you there will be somebody trying to get on the pole. But the, what is the most important part of qualifying? Is it track position or is it pit position? I think that all comes down to uh, the track sometimes because I've always, you know, I, I know as a kid it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you finish. Um, some tracks, you know, yeah, track position is very important. Some tracks, you know, pitting position is important. I know Dale and Art Jr. would occasionally actually choose, the, uh, would try and choose a pit stall right there where the start and finish line is for certain reasons, like, you know, try not to get lapped and stuff like that. So I, I, I you know, it, it, it kind of plays hand in hand depending on the track, um, you know. Perhaps maybe at a short track, it, it would be, or, or more like Kentucky, it would be for track position because of the the newer surface and the lower banking there. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, looking at it more now, I could definitely see that maybe NASCAR should just look at the teams and drivers and go, "Hey, go out and make a lap. If you don't, we'll just yeah. get to the, you know, you, you know, if you don't look, you didn't turn a lap. You're starting 39th, pal." So I mean, you know. Yep. Yeah, you yeah, I don't care if you were in the top 12, if you didn't if you didn't complete a lap, you're you're back to the end of the line. Yeah, just, and just I think that's and all it needs to happen. Go out there and qualify. Don't like you know, just just go out there. <laughs> yeah, no, I I agree. And I I think they're they're trying to outsmart themselves by doing this. Um yeah. so I, yeah. I I don't put this on NASCAR at all. I, yeah. I don't, this, this this is a team problem where these guys got to get smart about what they're doing, and um, you know think about getting their car. You know if they want pit, pit stall position or they want track position, you got to get out there and get a lap in. Um, yeah, and I notice like it seems to me that if Elliott doesn't win the pole, and I'm a nine car fan, and we know that mm-hmm. he he takes the first he takes the first stall, he takes the, the very first stall on the pits. Right. Uh, is there any advantage to having the first or stall out or the first stall in? Uh, I mean, is there really, truly, in my mind, is there any advantage? Because you got to travel the whole length of the pits anyway, no matter what. 
Um, and you got you got speed bumps and you, you know and, and speed monitoring going on all the way through. So it's the last two or three races I've seen Elliot. He, he's taken he's qualified in the top twelve. He's always taken the very first stall in to the pits. He's not mm-hmm. fighting anybody to get into his pit. Um, generally, people that are back there are usually a lap down by the time he gets in. So he probably isn't facing as much traffic as the guys up front are. Is there any big advantage to where you're if you're first in and last out or last in first out? What do you think? Uh geez, it, I always believe like yeah. once again, it just depends on the the track. You know, sometimes right. it's there. Short. You know, so Daytona yeah. and Talladega, obviously that really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, short tracks it matters because you, you know you want to get <laughs> you want to be able you want to be able to launch off the off the off the pit lane, and you can launch better off the first stall than you can off the last stall. But still, you still have to stop. You have to make your stop. You know, by the time the guy on the pole, like Johnson, was getting to his pit, Elliott was already launched and, and coming back down pit road with fresh tires and everything like that. And if, if you have a good pit crew, it should play out pretty equally, I, I would think. So, mm-hmm. so uh, we go back now to short track racing again, right? Back to Bristol? Mm -hmm. Yep, we go to Bristol. Yeah, we go to Bristol and Richmond. Also, um, Fox TV earned a 2.3 overnight rating, according to Adam Stern from yesterday's Texas race. Uh, No direct comparison since um, the race last year was on FS1, but that got a 1.7, and the 2017 race on Fox got a 2.5. Well, and I would say that's probably pretty strong, given the fact you got NCAA basketball going on all around you as well. Major League Baseball just kicked in. Yeah. Major League Baseball kicked in. Yeah, you got people that are baseball fans now. You know, the the TV market is dialing out a little bit. So, I think overall, in general, NASCAR is probably getting back to a better place. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah I yeah. agree. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking... yeah. Oh, was that Bobby? Bobby, jump on. Hello? I heard his voice. I heard his voice. I did. <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead and keep talking. I'll find All out right. if he's on or not. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I think NASCAR is certainly getting back on a better foot. Uh, you know, they're doing a much better job with marketing, like they're marketing outside of Fox and NBC, which is really good, um, you know, and just trying to make it more appealing. Because the other issue is I think you had, um, you know, you, you, you just lost some big stars to retirement, like Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, and Dale Hart Jr. To me, those three were probably the most popular drivers uh, growing up as a kid. So uh, and now yeah. I think you're starting to see that resurface with, you know, even with guys like Chase Elliott, Ryan Blaney, and Kyle Larson. So, yeah, I think NASCAR is. Uh, I think NASCAR is slowly. I always, I always believe that the 2020s would be a resurgence era, and I think it's starting even now. That uh, more people are starting to watch races, more people are starting to get into things. Oh, by the way, um, did you hear about this? That um, Daryl Waltrip, uh, according to Adam Stern, uh, Daryl Waltrip is considering retiring from broadcasting after this year, a move that uh, would end a nearly a 20-year run. That would be a shame. Uh, there's no reason to lose Daryl Walter. Um, yeah. I mean, he's good for the sport. Um, he, he's got great insight. And I, I think the Fox has put together a really good team. Um, oh. Actually, I think actually better than the NBC team, I believe. Um, you know, I miss it when we lose Fox um, after the July 4th race. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because I, I think that the, he brings great insight into the sport. He's got great colloquialisms that, that play well for the sport and things like that. So um, I had heard rumors of that too, like you'd said, but I, you know, I, I, I don't know why somebody, I don't, how old is Daryl Walter? Is he, he's not in his seventies yet, is he? Oh, I want to say he's in his seventies. Let me look it up real quick. Is he? Yeah. Yeah. Google it real quick. Daryl Walter is know. 72 years old. There you go. Okay. Well, you know, travel wears on you. Yeah. Um, Get you down. 
it does. But uh, and there could be other drivers that are you know, they want to bring in. Um, they, they could replace him. There's other, like I said, guys are retiring. But I think the great thing um, that's helping the sport right now is the younger drivers are starting to make marks. Um, you, you know, you've got you got a lot of young drivers now, Bubba Wallace, um, Byron, and mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot of the younger drivers now starting to be competitive and start winning. So you're kind of creating new heroes. And I think that's kind of what part of the salvation is. I know we, we didn't want to lose Gordon. We wouldn't lose Earnhardt. Uh, we didn't want to lose um, Kenseth and those guys. But uh, these younger drivers now are starting to not just be background drivers, um, they're starting to be, you know, competitive drivers. Eric Almirola has come basically out of nowhere. You know, he drove for Petty for a while, and, and now he, he's basically a he's a top ten driver almost every week. Um, and, yeah. and so I think that's that's a resurgence. The, the younger people coming back into the sport are getting finding new heroes that they, they like to root for. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's good. I think it's all good. Yeah. All righty. All right, um, Truex hasn't done much. Yeah, he's is he kind just of adapting? Thing. Is he adapting, or I think he's probably adapting to things. Uh, obviously, I think different atmosphere. Joe Gibbs, you know, first it was just kind of him, small team out of Denver, really successful. Um, and now Joe Gibbs Racing, he's got teammates. Obviously, I know first row was a technical affiliate with Joe Gibbs Racing, but uh, I still think Truex might be just adapting to the new team. And then um, our boy Kyle Larson, again, fails to be able to finish races. Uh, he runs strong for a period of time. You know, he likes that high line. He runs up against the wall. But is he – is Kyle Larson becoming a bust or what? I don't think Larson's necessarily a bust. He was really good in 2017. Um, it's really hard to say why he's struggling. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a Ganassi thing or, or Chevy thing, but it's kind of surprising that uh, Larson's been struggling. But I still think he can prevail and uh, get a win later in the season. Because actually, Kurt Busch, you know, comes into this, this team right away and is outperforming Kyle. Uh, yeah. You know, he's finishing higher. He's leading more laps. He's more competitive. And I just don't know about Kyle Larson. And the other one that – that kind of surprises me too, although he's ranked eighth in the points is Ryan Blaney. You know, he doesn't seem to be where he needs to be um, in terms of really being competitive for a win. He's up there. Like I said, he's eighth in points. He's a spot ahead of Elliott. Um, you know, he's in ninth and Bush is in tenth. But uh, Blaney too is another guy that just doesn't seem to be able to finish races. Your thoughts on that? Are there any thoughts? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he's in Penske equipment, isn't he? He's in Penske equipment. Mm-hmm. And Logano and Kozlowski you know, are clearly outperforming him. So. Yeah, I think Blaney will pick him at some point. I know Penske's kind of not had the best of luck when they've run three cars in the past, but we'll see. All right. Anything else we want to talk about on today's show? Uh, let's see. I don't think there's anything else. I brought up. Uh, I brought Daryl Waltrip, and I brought up um, the qualifying. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. I think right now we're set. All right, we're we gonna do a midweek show. Yeah, we can do a midweek show. See what breaks out. Still, still, an amazing thing is still no penalties. I mean, I have not heard. Have you? I've not. I did. I know they all come out um, usually on Monday, but I've not heard of any. I mean, this whole deal about losing losing the race and losing the win seems to have cleaned everybody's act up a little bit. Is that true? It's definitely possible that and uh, lack of cautions. And oh, I did want to bring up one thing uh, as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. On uh, on this day. In 26 years ago, um, gone too soon, we lost the 1992 champion and recent Hall of Fame inductee, Alan Kowicki. Uh Obviously, uh, what he's been Blank able to do... Blank, uh, 
What's that? He was flying in. He was flying into Bristol, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe he was flying yeah. from a sponsorship meetup or something, and uh, and uh, he had a he died in a plane crash. Obviously, remember Alan Kowicki and all the amazing things he done he has done in what I felt like a short amount of time in NASCAR. What he's been able to work with and able to accomplish, and who knows what he could have done more had he not died. So be sure uh, to remember Alan Kowicki. Yeah. And for his amazing life and his amazing career in racing. I believe that was the number seven Hooters car, wasn't it? Yep, the number seven Hooters Ford, the yep, Underbird. There you go. Yeah, the Underbird. There you go. <laughs> he was, and I he was a single-team driver. I mean, he owned his own team. He was a single-team driver. He was an engineer. And I believe he was a single-team. He owned his own team, didn't he? Didn't he own that racing team? Yeah. He worked on his own cars, yeah. built his own team from scratch, yeah. like a... Uh, seven people employed at his shop. Um, some yeah. really notable teams worked under him, actually, like Tony Gibson, later became a crew chief. Paul Andrews, who was his crew chief. Uh, even Ray Evernham worked at AK Racing for a little bit. There you go. Yeah, that was a great loss. That was a tragic loss. I mean, you know, for him to win. I think he beat Bill Elliott. Yes. He the championship the year before. Did he? Yeah, he, he edged out Bill Elliott. Um I want to say it was Atlanta. I think was, was it Atlanta where he beat him? Um, yeah, that am was I right Atlanta. or wrong there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was in Atlanta. Yeah, as I recall, and I'm, I've always been a nine car fan, I've always been an LA fan, so I, I remember that. And I was disappointed, but uh, yeah, that's that's a very memorable day. Thank you for bringing that up. Mhm. All righty. All right. To you, you want to wrap it up? Sure thing. All right, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the NASCAR show here on the Grueling Truth, where legends speak. We'll see you next time from Steve Ridley and myself, Alex Gray. We'll see you next time.